Hello there! It is time for another In Real Life video, or maybe I should say another watch along video, or a let's watch video, more, more aptly. Uh, yeah, another In Real Life let's watch video. So this time we are of course talking about the next two episodes of the Fallout TV series, Season 1. If you haven't seen the prior installment of this let's watch series of videos, uh, feel free to go check it out. We also did a little uh, preview prediction situation as well as we actually did a full watch along of the first trailer uh, when that came out. But needless to say, we're here. It's episode three and four, and we open sort of with a, another pre-war opening. We actually are going to seemingly get a fair amount of like aptly done time skipping to where uh, it's also not incredibly jarring given sort of the state of the world and the characters. I feel like um, there are other there are other video game television adaptations that have had time skips in them and sort of a chronological tellings of stories that were a little bit convoluted and difficult to follow. If you catch my meaning, I'm talking about the Witcher, uh, at least season one, but, uh, here we have another pre-war opening. It is with Walton Goggins's character. Uh, mind you, it is Walton, not Walter. I've seen so many people get it wrong. Uh, but uh, his character, pre-war, we still don't... I, I think we still do not know his name, actually. Uh, we only know him as the ghoul. Uh, but nonetheless, he is here filming some sort of uh, cowboy western, right? Uh, we sort of had this inclination from the beginning, given his, his sort of attire in the very first episode... Uh, but here we are again. He's learning of, as well of note here, in addition to the filming of this scene, um, we learn that on the production, someone named Bob was recently fired on account of being a communist sympathizer or a communist period, right? Um very fascinating. Definitely love that we're getting into this. And also a bit of a reminder to me, which I think I forgot to mention, the prior episode two ended with the uh, off-screen beheading. It ended with them sort of leaning up against a Chinese communist crashed satellite, right? With um, complete with all the, the appropriate logos and whatnot all over it. And as well, it reminds me that I think I also forgot to mention there seemed to be like a wink and a nod to Fallout 1's Iguana Bob in Episode 2 as well with a sort of Iguana on a stick fried Iguana uh, vendor sort of hawking the Iguana, right? And uh, the way in which it was done just very much evoked to me the whole Iguana Bob situation from the very first Fallout game, right? But Hey, that's no big surprise. The The show seems very keen on having these little fun winks and nods that you're really only going to pick up on if you have played any of the games. But uh, yeah, we're back here with Walton Goggins. Uh, he is killing it still. Every single scene that he is in uh, is just all the better, right? He's, he's uh, incredible in it, uh, as he has been in past works as well. Uh, right. Uh, what comes to mind most recently is his role in the Righteous Gemstones. He was very, very good in that. And like I said, he's been in tons of stuff. And every time uh, he takes on roles sort of like this um, and dude just kills it every time I've seen him in a role. I haven't seen all of them. I'm not like a Walton Goggins super fan, but uh, he should have super fans. Honestly, he should. He is very, very good. Uh, nonetheless, the taffy scene is excellent, very charming, very funny. Um, you also get to see at this movie production studio or whatever in the lots, you get to see, sorry, once again, I've got my um, my notebook here that I'm going to be sort of looking through, right? Apologies if I have to look down at it. Uh, but we've got this sort of gigantic pre-war globe statue in the background of the lot. Very cool to see that. Of course, those were sort of occasional staples of the games as well. That's sort of, I don't know, 
like imposing art deco sort of statue work, you know, there's just big heads and stuff like that. Uh, but that exists here too. And it shows up later, in fact. Um, but afterwards, we sort of go back to the ghoul as he's ghoulified, his ghoulification in uh, contemporary times in the wasteland. Uh, we see him sort of uh, sniffing around the same satellite that uh, Lucy and Dr. Science were at as well in the last video or in the last episode. Uh, he's sort of looking around there, tracking them, and then we find um, Lucy as well up ahead with the head, the head of uh, the doctor that she had ripped off. And she the the show also sort of goes out of its way to sort of establish that Lucy is in some way smitten, it seems, with uh, with Maximus, which I could very easily sort of see a situation in which, well, very obviously, we do not know everything about Maximus, right? There's definitely stuff being withheld here. Um, there's every time we see, and they've shown it like up to now two or three times, this little brief segment of a flashback of Maximus as a kid. And I wonder if there is way more to that scene that we don't know about where he like climbs out of the fridge and he's like a little child smiling up at uh, the Brotherhood Paladin, I guess, or Knight at the very least um, in power armor, sort of smiling up at them. And then it just cuts away. Right. Uh, very much seems like they're teasing some sort of reveal or like big twist of that situation. Right. Um, I don't know what the hell it could be, but maybe, um, I guess if I had to predict something, maybe he actually, maybe he, he dislikes the Brotherhood of Steel, right? Um, he says that, I think this was in one of the previews and this got me to think, thinking about it. Um, one of the previews for like previously on, and then it's, it leads up, right? It leads up to the next episode. I think this was in one of them where he says that he, the reason why he joined the Brotherhood of, of Steel is to hurt the people who hurt him in the same way that they hurt him. Something along those lines. And I have to wonder if that is sort of like a little fun trick, right? If the there will be a reveal in which, oh, he joined the Brotherhood of Steel to hurt the Brotherhood of Steel because they hurt him as a kid, Right. This was them engaging in some sort of fascist behavior wherein the Brotherhood of Steel rolled up on his town, as you can do in Fallout 4 uh, if you decide to side with them and sort of, you know, totally take control of the settlement and have them uh, offer up some of their crop yields to the Brotherhood, right? Something along those lines may have happened to him as a kid, and he is actually seeking vengeance against the Brotherhood and maybe that is his justification for potentially we don't know still uh, the boot situation and why he is so callous toward um, the Brotherhood of Steel in general. Right. He joined up to sort of take them down from within. But uh, in doing so, he's probably been taken out of his like comfort zone and is um, a little bit afraid of doing this, but um, probably has nothing else left to return to. Right. Um, he's really the only character that we don't know any sort of background on, right? Uh, we know stuff about Lucy's background and her family. Um, we still get, we get to see much more extended and longer glimpses of the ghoul's background, of course. Um, but very, very little on Maximus, which, like I said, leads me to believe that they're sort of um, playing it close to the chest. There's going to be a bit of a reveal. Anyway, back to my notes here. Uh, let's see. Right. So after sort of a scene of Lucy arriving at this like waterlogged area, uh, Maximus has to uh, get repairs on the power armor after it has been dinged up from combat with not only the Yao Guai, but also with the ghoul who really did a number on it um, by way of like having it slam into the ground and get all screwed up. Uh, has to sell a tooth or teeth for caps to get repair money. Uh, to have that done and turn it's a fun little gaff moment where it's like oh the repair is actually super quick uh he had to lose a tooth or a teeth uh for a very quick and like minor repair right but 
Uh, nonetheless, he comes back to his power armor and he gets a, a common lesson that a lot of Fallout 4 players will be treated to or have been treated to. And that is to, uh, especially if you're parking your power armor in a populated area, you need to always remove the fusion core if you're leaving it behind. Because he almost gets his power armor straight up jacked by some scavengers uh, just wandering up to it. And uh, there's a big like uh, melee brawl between them and it's pretty fun pretty wild you get to see a power armor gauntlet sort of pop the head of some dude like a fucking cherry it's absolutely wild um also uh, we get a sort of quote over the radio right with maximus communicating with um brotherhood of steel's headquarter or, or whatever right uh the folks coming down with orders and stuff who sent him out here in the first place they said that whoever gets the target will be will have control of the wasteland. The target, of course, being um, Dr. Science and or dog meat, or at the very least, whatever is inside of Dr. Science's head, uh, whatever that is, which seemed to be some sort of formula or chemical. But uh, we have multiple scenes, at least in these or at least one scene in these episodes. I think it's an episode four right but maybe i'm incorrect where um lucy tries to tap the exact part of the injection site and you still have that like whitish blue glow and she kind of get elect gets electrocuted by it i'm not sure um i have no idea what this could be at all um i'm completely yeah i'm completely unfamiliar with anything along this along these lines um, I'm guessing it must be something new or something, like I said, that I'm just unfamiliar with it within the Fallout lore. Uh, either way, uh, we come back again, the, the scene swap again, uh, to Lucy at Hollywood Boulevard in this sort of, um, waterlogged area. And once again, I also, also, I almost forgot, um, her, her weapon, her syringer. I think is actually technically uh, upon seeing it closer in this episode, because she does use it again. And I think maybe also having like a night's sleep or whatever. Um, this is not like a syringer as was depicted in Fallout 3 or 4 or 76. I'm pretty sure this is a syringer as was depicted. And I'm not even sure if it's called that. Right. Right. But um, the sort of Syringer-esque weapon that exists in Fallout 2, I think that is what it is modeled after. I 100%, I'm, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that has got to be it, right? Which is pretty wild. Another um, classic Fallout throwback with that. Uh, sorry, just, just wild for me to sort of see those in there because I, I was not expecting uh, as many throwbacks to the CRPGs as we have been getting. And I have to wonder if there's any, like, Brotherhood of Steel or Fallout tactics that we're getting. And I have zero experience with those games. So I'm wondering if if that stuff is in here and it's just going over my head, right? Entirely possible. Uh, but nonetheless, Lucy is out here and the ghoul catches up with her and is held up for the head, of course, because that is the bounty. Um, but the head gets lost in a way. It has been taken by... Axlotls, Gulper Axlotls. Uh, however, before we get to deal with that, we actually go back to the vault, to Vault 33, um, to Lucy's brother, who is kind of like a major character in his own right, despite not being on like any of the posters. Um, there is a surprising amount of focus on her brother Norm back at Vault 33, which uh, good enough because there's plenty of mystery around Vault 33 and 32 and 31. Uh, let's see here. So, yeah, we come to find out, um, fully revealed. It may have been mentioned before in passing. I didn't pick up on it, but the three of these vaults, 31, 2, and 3, are interlinked. All three of them are interlinked in this way. Um, and, uh, the sort of slogan for the three of them is stronger together, right? And I'm sure that this must in some way play into their weird screwed up vault tech experiment, right? Their weird sociological experiment that they're uh, playing on these people. But um, regardless, we find out that they're linked. Uh, Norm, her brother, Lucy's brother 
is to get demoted, of course, for helping Lucy leave the vault, right? And he is demoted to sort of running food to and just doing general clerical work with the raiders, right? They have captured the raiding party that had entered the vault, and they're holding them prisoner inside of their uh, former library area, right? And they're actually having a big discussion, and there's much debate about what exactly to do with them. Uh, there's very fun moments where seemingly the two de facto leaders, now what with Overseer Hank missing, the new two de facto leaders sort of um, trying to do one-upmanship or whatever, um, and just like nonstop empty posturing, empty platitudes and stuff about um, how to best deal with the situation. It's very funny. It's very charming. Uh, I very much enjoy it very much. Uh, it seems like it's meant to be like a, a satirization of uh, contemporary politics, I think. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we, we have all of that. Um, we get to as well. Well, no, not quite yet. Right. Yeah, not quite yet. We do. We get to all this yet. All right. So next up, we go back to. Um. Max and his new squire, who is one of the other pre-squires, one of the recruits from the Brotherhood of Steel, and we get to see how they're trying to track down their target as well. There is evidently, and like I said, as far as I know, this didn't exist in any of the games, they have a radiation tracker that they can use to track a ghoul, right? The ghoul, um, which is how they're attempting to track down the head that has gone missing. They're somehow using this to track the ghoul uh, to some effect because, of course, tracking radiation in an irradiated wasteland uh, is a bit problematic. And, of course, uh, things end up going awry. Uh, we also, uh, as they're traveling out, we end up cutting over back to uh, the ghoul and Lucy, who are having a bit of a wild moment trying to get the head. Um Lucy being used as live bait for the gulpers. Um, and we also find, let's see here. Oh yeah. Uh, the, a crucial moment, which at the time didn't, didn't seem like too much to me. Um, in sort of the commotion with the gulpers and with Lucy, Lucy smashes the ghoul sort of stash of what I thought were just drugs, just like nondescript drugs. Uh, but, these are vials of some other type of drug, which I am completely unaware of. And as far as I know, are new that this is like new world building and lore, right? Anyway, we'll get into that more in episode four. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say, they're unable to get the head, but they uh, sort of ward off the gulper in a sort of life or death situation. Lucy is taken effectively hostage uh, loses her boot to the gulper, gulps it down. Uh, you get a weird, gnarly shot of her foot. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going on there. But um, nonetheless, they're making off together. Uh, there's a fun little line wherein uh, the ghoul mentions that there's a, as well a rule of the wasteland in which you always get like nonstop sidetracked by bullshit, right? Which very obviously seems like a nod to just getting inundated with countless side quests. Very enjoyable. And of course, uh, Lucy uh, brings up the golden rule that she learned in the vault, sort of, um, you know, showing the juxtaposition between her, like, vault dweller upbringing and the naivete of such um, compared to the ghoul's own sort of hardened and, frankly, uh, sinister evil outlook on life. Anyway, after all of that, uh, we we cut back to the Squire and Maximus sort of just talking, um, getting to know each other, getting to, to learn like, oh, Maximus kind of feels bad for this Squire being put in this situation. Um, the Squire has no idea that this is Maximus, still thinks that it's Titus. Um, Maximus is presumed dead and thus is able to sort of hear what this Squire thought of Maximus. And it wasn't too bad. Um generally pr fairly fairly endearing stuff also get to learn of a fly farm 
which I'm assuming here we're talking bloat flies, uh, right? Because otherwise it'd be a little wild to be doing this. But um, uh, they talk about how they fed these flies their shit in order to like harvest and like gather up bloat flies, I assume. And then they would mulch up the flies and just eat them right from their own poop uh, from human human shit would attract the flies to feast on it. And then they would capture the flies and grind them up into like edible food that isn't poop. Right. Pretty, uh, pr- pretty wild scene. Pretty fun insight into, uh, honestly, I think a great idea, uh, to have these fly farms, right? Absolutely makes sense that this is something that people would do, especially in more inclement areas like California, which is very much like classic desert wasteland rather than. You know, there's some trees here and there, or holy cow, we're in Appalachia, there's trees everywhere. You know, stuff like that. Uh, makes sense as a reliable source of food. Uh, let's see. So then we go back to, as well, like I said, Vault 33, with the uh, sort of debate over what to do with the imprisoned raiders. Do you try to rehabilitate them, or, uh, as Norm suggests, murder them, right? Sort of going back to the golden rule uh, that Lucy had brought up, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself, um, sort of twisting that in a way in saying they would have killed us, thus we should kill them, right? Uh, if they were given the opportunity, they would have killed us, ergo, we should be killing them. And in this way, uh, Norm is kind of, al- although I'm I'm kind of down for the, for what Norm is preaching here, um, Norm is kind of by way of the cinematography painted as is this guy kind of screwed up? Is he becoming kind of evil here? Is this is this whole event kind of making Norm a little bit more sinister uh, than he used to be? And that definitely seems like it's going to be a plot point going forward. Uh, Also, uh, they have now an imperative to either find some replacement parts or a replacement uh, something or other. Uh, because, of course, once again, in a direct nod to Fallout 1, uh, the water chip has been broken, has been broken in the commotion of the Raiders attacking Vault 33, uh, which I have to imagine they should be able to get a replacement water chip from one of their interlinked vaults from either 32 or 31, which we know nothing about. So far, we have only just learned that 31 is linked up to them in a three-way, but we don't know anything about Vault 31 at all. We haven't seen the interior of it. We have seen the interior of 32 plenty, but nothing of 31. But regardless, they have like a physical prop of a water chip. Looks, um, as best I can remember, it looks exactly like the one you see at the start of Fallout 1 in this sort of uh, cinematic as the overseer there is sort of directing you the original vault dweller to leave and go find a replacement water chip. As far as I remember, it looks exactly like that water chip. It really, uh, it's, it's silly to be so taken aback and enjoy just that sort of, I don't know, the, the prop design, the costuming, the set design and all of that. But man, it is so one-to-one. It is mind blowing, right? There, there is so, there is something to be said for how true to the games it really is. It it is so wild the way in which it is handled. Uh, but yeah, true enough that that's your Fallout One water chip <laughs> right there. Uh, but um, we go back to uh, the Gulper situation where now by now uh, Lucy and the Ghoul have left, and Maximus and the Squire are now in the Ghoul area using their tracker. Uh, they have a big run-in with the gulpers, or the gulper, the axolotl gulper. Um, they save one another, and sort of the squire surprise again save the gulper. The way in which they kill the gulper, I don't fully understand how they killed it. Uh, this axolotl gulper has like a whole bunch of nasty like fingers inside of its mouth to sort of push uh, food further in to gulp it down, and some I'm not sure what Maximus exactly does. He definitely does not use a regular gun, 
um, the squire shoots uh, one of the like five five six um, like big Fallout four assault rifles at the at the axolotl, but it does not kill it. It only pisses it off. And I'm I'm not sure how Maximus does kill it. Right, we get a close up of its eyes, sort of like going buck wild. It's looking like absolutely nuts in its eyes, and the way in which this gulper dies, I can really only explain as Maximus somehow gets this gulper to vomit itself to death. I'm I'm not sure how it how it went down. I may have like looked away from the television or something and missed it. But I'm not sure exactly how he got it to die. It just, to what I saw, it looked like he just like engaged its gag reflex so bad that it threw up and died from the very force of it throwing up, which I don't know, maybe exactly what happened. Um, it part of its insides, it's like tongue or something also get vomited up. Like it's partly, I don't know, like 20% inside out by way of it throwing up. Uh, but anyway, of course, from the vomit, they find all sorts of goodies. They find um, Lucy's missing boot. They find uh, the head, right? So now the Brotherhood is in possession of this, uh, this very important scientific MacGuffin, that being Dr. Science's head. Uh, Dogmeat is also now hanging out with them in a way because um, Dogmeat stayed behind uh, when uh, the ghoul and Lucy left after the gulper attack. Uh, but uh, from then on, we we go back to Lucy and the ghoul, and they are sort of further in the sort of movie studio lot, and we can see uh, that same statue, like I said before, we can see that same statue uh, now screwed up and desiccated as 200-plus years have gone by. Um we get to see a bunch of that and then uh, more on Norm becoming potentially evil. And then finally we get uh, go back into pre-war times with Walton Goggins, character as a human. Um, we get to see, of course, like I said, more, more scenes with his, um, well, no, no, no longer with his daughter, but uh, with his wife. And evidently we hear that they're sort of closing down production on, or not even closing down production on, but more so wanting to get his his character, his actor, this actor, to uh, work for vault doing advertising, just straight-up advertising. And it is at this moment, and of course, um, we, we get to see a couple representatives from vault but they don't really say too much. We don't really have too much development with them. Uh, very much seemingly meant to be just, like, nameless uh, suits. And their suits... Uh, at least of, of the menswear here looking very good, uh, very era appropriate. This sort of three button front closure suit, right? Where the top two, you're meant to button it and leave the, the third one unbuttoned pro tip for anyone uh, wearing like a suit or tailored jacket of any kind. Uh, pretty much never button the bottom button. Never do this. Um, it is a major fashion faux pas. And is like um, anyone who knows anything about, getting dressed in that aesthetic will tell you you never bottom the button bot the bottom button. Uh, sometimes you button the top one, uh, but sometimes you do not. Uh, it depends on sort of the make of it, but uh, the bottom one never. Anyway, long story short, uh, we go back to Cooper. Uh, Cooper Howard, I think his name is. Um, yeah, yeah, Cooper Howard. We do learn his name. Yeah, my bad. We totally know his name. My bad, my bad. Uh, Cooper Howard. And uh, this, we have a really wild sort of um, background, backstory, lore-filling moment wherein uh, he ends up being the guy who invents the thumbs up, right? The How Vault Boy always does the iconic thumbs up gesture it is none other than this guy walton goggins's character who just sort of improvised it for the camera when he was doing all this it seems as if he is the one who straight up uh created that 
bit of advertising that they use all over town, everywhere. Which also, in some ways, uh, perhaps has contributed to his disdain in it, because in the next episode, uh, he sees a billboard of the Vault Boy giving that thumbs up, and I believe this is toward the end of the episode, uh, but he straight up shoots it right in the face, uh, very pissed at it, uh, but nonetheless, uh, sorry, we, we have to go back a little bit for the start of episode four, uh, which once again begins with the ghoul and Lucy traveling together. Um, they go to a West Side clinic slash medical building. I'm, I can't quite remember what it was. Uh, West Side of Los Angeles, I think, or at least California. Um, uh, nonetheless, they're out there. They encounter another ghoul who is kind of friendly, but is seemingly going feral. And here we also get um, in this episode, this in, in fact, this whole episode kind of focuses on it. Um, we get more lore on the feralification of ghouls, right? Um, as far as I remember, there is no solid way to know how long a ghoul has until they go feral. And as far as we know, there's no way to uh, proactively defend against a ghoul going feral. However, apparently there is. Apparently we do have a way to do that, and it exists here. And I wonder if we will learn more about this, right? I wonder if this is just like them coming up with a sort of science fiction reason for how this works, right? Because, you know, uh, science fiction sort of lends itself to having a set of, like, tenured rules uh, for the fiction to follow. Um. But I wonder if this is new, something that has been developed either on the West Coast or in the few years that we had missed. I don't know. Maybe it's something that was being worked on by the Brotherhood slash uh, Enclave. I have no idea. Uh, but either way, if you are a ghoul and you want to prevent yourself from going feral, you need these um, vials. We don't know what they're vials of. We don't know anything really about them, but vials are what are needed. And as it turns out, the stash that got smashed in the last episode by Lucy at the Gulper encounter was our ghoul, the ghoul's uh, stash of vials. And uh, here we get to see this other random non-feral ghoul about ready to go feral, sort of breaking in and out of a more uh, of, of like their humanity to going feral, sort of going back and forth. And of course, our ghoul, the ghoul uh, ends up, uh, shooting them right through the head, blowing their, their head clean off effectively. Um, and then uh, we get a great scene of of uh, of the cannibal perk in action, but not just from the ghoul, right? Sort of eating, I believe it was called ass jerky, trying to make some ass jerky. And we get to we get shots of this ass jerky for a while throughout this episode. Um, this ass jerky slowly getting jerkified. Um, but Lucy also seemingly goes in for a bite of, uh, of near feral ghoul, right? Which seems really odd or really wild for her to eat. Um, I have no idea how many rads she has built up at this point, but, uh, throughout this episode, she definitely gets a lot more because she drinks some radiated water. Uh, she's coming into contact with all sorts of radiated stuff now. I have to wonder how this all is going to play out with her. Uh, it is definitely alluded to by the ghoul that she will undergo ghoulification before long. Um, and she she even acknowledges it herself at one point in the, the episode saying, like, I will look like you, but I will never be like you uh, because she still maintains her sort of kindness, her golden rule. Uh, standing she maintains that throughout the episode anyway uh we get as well her full name that being lucy mclean and as well that comes up as well later with uh, her brother norm and their mother who turns out to be called rose mclean which we don't really know anything about this but uh the show sort of treats this as like kind of an important deal uh as well the ghoul when learning that Lucy's last name is McLean is also a bit taken aback by that. So there's definitely something to do 
with the McLean family and their lineage. There's something weird going on where they're somewhat well known in the area. Uh, but regardless, we're back in Vault 33 with Norm. There is um, new overseer elections are upon us coming soon. Um, as was sort of alluded to in the prior episode, it's it's coming up. Uh, there's now formal like um, election advertisements up inside the vault. Uh, 100% seems like Norm is also going to run for overseer. Um, not made very evident. Norm isn't properly advertising like the other two candidates, but it really seems like uh, Norm may be in the running and very well may win because um, uh, the one of the dwellers who had gotten her eye sort of super duper damaged seems to really agree with his uh, sort of stance on what to do with the imprison the, the prisoners that they have taken. And she very much misses uh, Bert, who was her, her baby daddy who got killed in the attack. Uh, so much so that um, I don't know who this, <laughs> what this guy's name is. But he's like, he's Mr. Handsome, I guess. Uh, he's, he's like this, uh, this, I, I don't know. He was smitten for Lucy at the beginning. But I believe they said that, that they were technically cousins, which I don't know. Fair enough in the vault. I mean, who ain't right? But, um, either way, uh, one eyed Wilma here is definitely into him as well and has him wearing, a whole lot of her her husband's former her former husband's um like outfits and and all of that wearing his like cardigan his scarf uh his shoe and she is she is completely into it and she is she just immediately uh is ready to bang the dude right there in her vault room and uh of course she is pregnant and right as they're about to get it on uh, her water breaks, and uh, throughout the rest of the episode, we get glimpses of her going into labor and uh, having the baby sort of behind them and all of that. Very, very wild stuff. Uh, I, honestly, uh, the Fallout show, way more horny, right, uh, than almost every other fall Fallout game. I will say, however, it is probably on par with how horny Fallout 2 is. Uh, Fallout 2 is exceedingly horny. And I would say that the TV series is as horny as Fallout 2, right? There is, uh, up till now, we've had, like, people jacking off in under their beds. Uh, we've had people just, like, just just people incredibly horny. Just, just real horny people. Uh, great, right? <laughs> like I said, uh, true to Fallout 2, uh, Fallout 2 exceedingly horny, maybe, maybe more horny than this right for now. But, uh, I think we can, we can get there. I think we can get up to the Fallout 2 levels of horniness. No problemo. Uh, but regardless, uh, we've also got a situation with, um, Lucy and the ghoul where they have a bit of a scrap in front of a puddle of irradiated water where she just gets finally fed up with him, um, chops off his finger, and then sort of in a, um, you know, in an eye for an eye fashion, uh, he goes and takes her finger as well. Mind you, the fingers in question are their right hand index, which would be the trigger finger, right, for a weapon. Uh, Lucy eventually ends up getting the finger back, when they go to a super duper mart where uh, she thought that she was going to be sold as a sex slave to whoever was inside of the super duper mart there. Uh, but it turns out that inside of the super duper mart was none other than I think Matt Barry, Matthew Barry as a Mr. Handy who does like a, a killer job voicing the character. Honestly, uh, absolutely fantastic performance from him as a Mr. Handy. Um, also, back at the vault, uh, Norm learns that Vault 32 was up to something a little bit weird. Uh, they sneak into Norm, Lucy's brother, and Mr. Handsome 
sneak into Vault 32 and find out that um, indeed not all was as it appeared. Um, of course, in the early episodes, we got glimpses of this and learning like something about this is off. Uh, the timing of this looks wrong. Even though there are raiders here, they don't seem fully responsible for everything that went on here. And true enough, they begin finding out stuff about that. Um, it seems as though maybe um, it has been two years, I believe it was, since the original denizens of that vault died. There's a whole bunch of markings up in there about like they know what happened, the truth of the situation. It seems heavily implied that maybe Vault 33 is responsible and perhaps eight ate, ate them. Uh, we don't know for certain, but it is definitely implied that that is the case. I don't know if that is the case, but they are in some way responsible, it seems. Uh, anyway, uh, the Mr. Handy, Snip Snip, ends up getting fried by Lucy back at the Super Duper Mart. Uh, find a couple like drugged up raiders who were holding a whole bunch of ghouls, some feral, some not. Lucy ends up freeing them. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me here. All right, sorry about that. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, back at the Super Duper Mart, these two drugged up raiders, um, they have the all these ghouls captured. Lucy frees them. There's this ghoul whose name is Martha and ends up being Lucy's sort of first real kill as Martha sort of, um, like the ghoul at the beginning, is kind of going between feral and non-feral. A whole lot on ghoul mechanics and ghoul systems this time, which, fair enough, they're introducing, like, new lore here. Um, sort of further fleshing out how ghouls work. I have to wonder if some of this does exist in some form already, or if this was, like, planned stuff, because I cannot help but be reminded of, um... Oh, what was it called? The the Fallout Bible and whatnot. That was penned around the, I think, around the time of Fallout 2. Speaking of Fallout 2, um, that had a whole bunch of both used and unused and thus canon and, and not canon lore inside of it. Stuff that was slated for the original Fallout 3, Van Buren. But, of course, um, with the closure of Black Isle, never actually made it. And I wonder if they're actually pulling from stuff in there. I'm way less familiar with, like, the contents of the Fallout Bible as it was. But I have to wonder how much of that is being pulled here with regards to, like, um, these rules on ghoulification and whatnot. Either way, I, I wonder what people think of this. Like, the, the vile situation and how that works. Personally, I, I really like it. Like I said, um, I don't mind at all. I, I think it seems like overall a net positive to have more like harder sci-fi rules for how it works. I kind of enjoy that. Uh, nonetheless, anyway, uh, we're sort of flicking back between um, Lucy's situation there at the Super Duper Mart with the ghouls and at Vault 33 wherein we find about Rose McLean, or uh, McLean, uh, Lucy and Norm's mother, who somehow was able to get entry to the vault, to 32, by way of having a Pip-Boy, um, which is definitely meant to be like some sort of big reveal. Some, there's something afoot with their mother. We have no idea yet. I'm guessing she will show up at some point in the future and is potentially why Hank got kidnapped, right? I would guess that there is some sort of link there. Um, anyway, uh, we have Lucy sort of leaving the Super Duper Mart with um, the ghoul going there back into it to raid it for drugs. The ghoul, of course, passed out, ran out of vials, but um, Lucy is sort of being very merciful and giving a whole bunch of vials that she took from the Super Duper Mart to the ghoul, so the ghoul is sort of back in action. Uh, ghoul is running through Super Duper Mart, taking all the drugs that the raider, the like drugged up raiders had, having like a great time um, watching as well an old hollow tape, which turns out to be none other than <laughs> what a coincidence, a movie that he acted in in pre war era. Um, the perhaps ending note of this being 
the reshoot that occurred and was teased at the start of this or the prior episode, um, wherein they had sort of the bad guy in the in the movie swapped out or not swapped out but what happens to them got rewritten normally as cooper howard uh, remarks that his his antagonists in his show or movie or whatever normally get arrested they just go to jail right but it was rewritten to where he shoots him dead and he himself starkly contrasted to how he is today as a ghoul uh, he himself comments, man, I don't like that I have to kill him. That seems unlike my character. I don't really care for it. I don't like it. Uh, but ultimately, we see that he went through with it and does kill him. And it is revealed through dialogue that this was all rewritten to be anti-communist propaganda produced by, I guess, vault I'm not sure. Whoever runs the, the studio, I think it might be vault Tech, given their involvement in everything there, but I'm not positive yet. Uh, but either way, it's completely reshot to sort of be anti-communist propaganda. Um, he says, like, some, like, eat dirt, you, you commie bastard or something like that after he shoots him uh, right in the head. And... Um, I don't know, definitely meant to seem like an escalation, like the character is sort of um, veering from his normal path that he would have wanted um, by virtue of whoever is pulling the strings here, right? Uh, very good to get sort of this pre-war politics, I think. I'm super duper into that. Um, as for the next couple episodes, I don't really know exactly what will happen here. Um... Maximus and the Squire have got the the head. We don't really know where or what Lucy and the Ghoul are going to do. They're just kind of hanging out there. Neither of the two of them have a lead on Maximus. I guess they know roughly where Moldova is, um, the braider leader that they're looking for. Um, so I'm guessing they'll probably go there and maybe learn more, maybe find Hank anyway. Uh, I'm guessing that we'll have some sort of reveal about Hank that he's not actually as nice as it seems. And we're very clearly being set up for something about uh, Lucy and Norm's mother. And of course, there's stuff popping off in Vault 33. Maybe they'll go back to Vault 33 at some point, you know, uh, such as the way of being a vault dweller. Of course, you have to go back to the vault you came from and see how it has changed in the interim. Right. Very much a, a fallout trope. Anyway, that all do it for this one. Uh, episodes. Three and four, when next we return, it will be five and six. We're at the halfway point now. Only only eight episodes in this, remember. Until next time, please take care of each other. <laughs>